There was an agricultural revolution in sub-Saharan Africa in the 18th century. It arrived with the advent of a plow in that part of the world. For centuries, uh, the people of the area had used a particular kind of plow, and Ethiopian uh, European farmers arrived with a best practice plow. A plow that had been tested over many generations with many families. A plow that had been proven to work. A plow that was effective in increasing agricultural production. And so this agricultural revolution was birthed with the transition from the Ethiopian plow that had been used to a European plow. The agricultural revolution resulted in this desertification. You can find books published called uh, Drought Follows the Plow. Because they arrived with a plow that had been tested in one context and made the assumption that the plow would be right in the next context. The, the Ethiopian plow, as you've seen in the previous picture, like many plows in arid regions, simply penetrates the soil and then breaks it. The European plow, developed for moist, wet soils, has that little funny twirl that you are used to on plows, and so it digs into the soil and turns the soil. In doing so, it exposes the moist soil underneath. And in semi-arid contexts, what that means is that the protective layer of dry soil on the top gets removed, and now you've got a deep layer of dry soil that's been exposed. And when you get a deep layer of dry soil that gets exposed, that reduces vegetation, and when you reduce vegetation, you increase soil temperature. And when you increase soil temperature, you reduce humidity and rain. And therefore, you reduce vegetation, which increases temperature, which reduces rain, which increases dust, which results in the kinds of famines and things we saw across the whole Sahel, the whole Sub-Saharan Africa uh, last century. Drought follows the plow. It was a very good plow, but it was fundamentally flawed in the premise that best practice works. It assumes that A plus B equals C in farming. It assumes that in one place where you did something, that where you did A and added to it B, you would get C, that if you took that thing and transplanted it into another place, you would get the same result. Best practice functions well in environments where that is true, where you can know that when you step into one context and you repeat the same thing, you will get the same results. In most step-up situations, in most places of complexity, in most places of poverty, most places of education, we don't deal with that kind of thing. Best practice doesn't imply that it's simple. The European Space Agency recently landed a washing machine on a comet. It's a pretty complicated thing to do. Ten years out, they decided that they were going to launch this washing machine into space. They predicted that they would fly it around the solar system and get it to intercept a comet that was incoming 10 years later and land it on the planet. It's a remarkable feat. I don't understand most, well, any of the science that got it there. But it is predictable. A plus B equals C. The rules surrounding landing the washing machine on the comet are predictable. The variables that are involved are reasonably controllable in such a way that you can decide 10 years out you're going to land a washing machine on a comet. In the context of poverty and in the context of making change, that kind of mindset doesn't help. That kind of mindset results in deserts when you are hoping for agricultural revolution. That kind of mindset imprisons people rather than frees them. In most contexts, complexity is more it, complexity is a thing that's more in play. This is a picture of a, of a set of starlings called a murmuration. You can Google it and watch the video clip moving. It's quite entrancing. But in complexity and in complex systems, you can't see cause and effect. You can sometimes see it in hindsight. So you can be doing something, you can look back and recognize that when I did A and then we did B, we got to C. But it doesn't tell you that the next time you do A and B, you're going to get to C. And that's often the mistake that people make in trying to solve problems and trying to step up to problems in this kind of context. Is that we assume because we did A and B last time, we'll always get C. And that rather than thinking about best practice, we should be thinking about emergent practice. Practice that emerges out of a context that we're watching carefully, that we are watching for feedback, seeing what works, seeing what is working in that particular context and strengthening it 
and things that aren't working reducing it. The, there's a community development practitioner called Margaret Ledworth, and she talks about the problem with many community development practitioners is that we end up with a string of palliatives that are incoherent in the long-term quest for social justice. We do things because they make us feel better, not because they actually make a difference. We yearn for best practice because when we've got best practice, then we feel like we've got an answer to these huge problems in front of us and we feel better about ourselves. But they don't ultimately do anything. So what can we do? If we can't tie ourselves into menu-driven best practices, what are we left with? And I've got a bunch of five words that are big and huge and it took me a long time to work them out. But um, Jim Cochran is an academic at UCT, also works in Germany and the States, and has worked with others on something called leading causes of life. And I found that quite helpful, because they started saying, what are the principles that perhaps you should hold as you move into these spaces? What principles could you think about as you think about complexity and making a difference? The first one is coherence. Coherence is about making sense of life, about having a sense of your journey as having some level of story to it, as not being random, as knowing that I've got a part to play in this world. You hear it evidenced in Tabo's story about himself and Tabo's desire for others is for them to understand their story, to understand their narrative within the broader narrative of our lives. And so when we look at stepping up and making a difference, are we building coherence into people's lives? Are we helping them understand their part in the story? Secondly, connection. Are we building social capital? Are we building connections between people? Are we growing communities that enable us to respond to threats in ways that help us resolve them quickly and easily? I was in a conversation in South America a couple of weeks ago with some Central Americans, and they were talking about the, the, what they term the triangle of death which is the parts of Central America that are being held captive by narco-traffickers where there's insanely high levels of assassination and murder. The one country that backing the trend there is Nicaragua. Nicaragua, which by many other measures is very poor. Nicaragua, which has abandoned some of the neoliberal understandings of how their capital needs to be functioned. But one of the things they've worked on very carefully is building connection within their neighborhoods, building community. And they have the lowest murder rate and assassination rate in the area. They are the safest nation in that place. They have resisted to the narco traffickers because they've built a connection. Thirdly, agency. The capacity or resourcefulness to act. To act within our capacity and to believe we can bring about change. It's a critical thing that when we think about projects because very often the methodology of best practice actually works against agency. There's an Indian theologian by the name of Jaya Kumar Christian. He talks about the poor being imprisoned by the God complexes of the rich. When we choose to step up, when we desire to step up, one of the things that's at play is our desire to make a difference, and that is good, and we should embrace it and push it. But the other part that's at play, certainly in my life, let me not place it on you, <clears throat> is this enjoyment of being the person that makes the change, of being the one that made the difference. And that little God complex can imprison those who I'm trying to help because it removes agency from them. And so as we think about projects, as we think about stepping up, how are we breaking agency? Fourthly, hope. How do we grow hope? Hope that imagines a different and healthier future. Hope that creates energy to do something different. Hope isn't a naive optimism that says it's going to be all right, it really is. <laughs> hope understands how particularly difficult it is to make the choices that people have to make. The kinds of stories that outliers are doing, the very difficult ways of doing it. Hope understands that, but pulls out a different future. And lastly, intergenerativity, which is the word I struggle just to say in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's a big word for saying building connection across generations. I was at a gathering of activists last year, of young activists in their 30s, and I was struck by the interaction we gave them with many members who were from the UDF and places like that. And what wasn't happening was presenting the UDF as a best practice for what they should be doing in this age. But the connection between them, the building of community between them, inspired both to be envisaging a different life. Similarly, my son, who's 15, sat with a friend of mine who was involved in activism type work, and his, the stories that she was telling him 
recently helped him think about his presence in his school and how he can make a difference. That movement across generations helping us. So what do we do? Rainbows are often the pot of gold. And we all know that when you try and pursue the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you never get there. The rainbow keeps moving away. As we seek to bring about change in complex systems in the context of our society against injustice, I think the search for this panacea that's going to solve it, for the shortcut that's going to take it away by tomorrow, for the thing that's going to work in every circumstance at every time, is a bit like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But rainbows are also signs. They tell us that the rain is going to end and the sun is going to shine. They tell us that there is some future. They tell us that things aren't always going to be the same. And so every time we hear the story of a, of a school club that makes a difference, every time we hear the story of an answer series, of a fish farm, of a thing that works, we don't have to yearn towards it as the answer and panacea for all things, but we can lean into it and say, how does this pull us forward in hope, in real vigorous hope to make a difference? Because too many children in this country start school and don't finish it, and we have to do something about that. Too many children in this country finish a trick in ways that doesn't leave them any hope that their lives are going to be any different, and we have to do something about that. And the rainbow of hope that says change is possible calls that out to us.